Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is April 29th of 2022, and the markets this week have been a continuation of the pattern that we've seen really since the start of the year, which is a lot of chop, slight bias toward the downside. Now, the good news is as of mid-morning today on Friday, uh, our strategies are slightly up for the week versus down in the market. Now, a lot can change between now and the close of the market as we've all come used to uh, over the last few weeks. But slowly but surely, we are starting to see some washout levels, in particular with growth stocks, secular growth stocks, areas of the market that we focus on. And that's really going to be our theme for this week's uh, for this week's update, which is, of course, uh, defeating kryptonite, as we say. So kryptonite to growth stocks is inflation. So how does the battle against inflation turn? And when that battle does turn, what's going to work? And what we've seen in history is as inflation slows down, as growth rates slow down, we actually see growth stocks that begin to bottom and start to offer leadership in the overall stock market. So for this week's update, we're going to focus on the fact that U.S. stocks, believe it or not, remain the cleanest shirt in the hamper, whether we're looking at bonds, whether we're looking at foreign stocks, whether we're looking at alternative asset classes and real estate, U.S. stocks actually remain the cleanest shirt in the hamper. Uh, number two, investors are the most spare since March of 2009. I want everyone to think back to March of 2009 and how awful it felt. That's kind of where we're at today. And of course, what we did know back then was that was a generational moment to put money to work. And then lastly, we think growth stocks have definitely reset. We know that for a fact. Uh, but the, the most attractive thing is that they're still growing, and a lot of those growth rates are accelerating, which we're going to go through today. Now, in terms of sentiment, as we said before, the AAI bulls, in terms of the number of, uh, the number of bulls uh, in the overall market, less than 20% for the third consecutive week. This has only happened one other time, which is December 1988. Understandable. That was about a year removed from the great 1987 crash. Again, we go back to prior bear markets and what were some of those tea leaves that suggested we were approaching a low? Washed out investor sentiment. And we can see here on a Z-score, negative 2.2. That's exactly where we were in March of 2009, a little bit worse in October of 2011. But overall, these sentiment levels, uh, it's very rare to see people this bearish. And almost time and time again, a year later off these levels, you've seen positive returns. Now, it, it can take some time. It doesn't mean that the bottom is going to be today or next week or maybe even the week after. But when we look at those one-year time periods, these are generally in the vicinity of attractive areas to start putting money to work. And we see that again playing out here on this chart. We can see here in the red, the level of bearish investors versus bullish investors. This 16.4%, ladies and gentlemen, quite simply, I'm not even sure I've seen this in my career. I believe it was actually slightly higher in March of 09. I got to go back and look at the data. But this is one of the most bearish environments I have ever witnessed and experienced. And again, that sounds bearish, but from an investor standpoint, when you're putting new money to work, that's actually kind of what you want to see. Either if you already own stocks and you're looking at when is this going to end, or number two, if you have some cash put to work, uh, is this a good time or not? Now, the fundamental question here, especially for investors in our strategies or for new investors that are kicking the tires is, you know, are growth stocks right for me? So we put together a host of questions here that should really help you understand whether or not it makes sense to put more money to work. The first and foremost thing we got to understand is what is my time horizon? When I'm speaking with clients or our advisors are speaking with clients, the number one thing I always ask is, what is your time horizon? Do you have more than four years? If you have more than four years, now, in my opinion, if you have the tolerance for volatility, is a great time to start looking at some of these heavily discounted growth stock leaders in the U.S. stock market. Number two, am I willing to put money in at these depressed prices? We often get, it, with the stock market for one reason or another, it's different than when we go to a clothing store or whether we get a department store or we go to the auto dealership where we get excited about low prices. 
for one reason or other, investors in many cases get scared of low prices, thinking there's something else out there about the hit. Low prices is when you want to put money to work. Buy highly valuable merchandise that's deeply on sale. But you also have to ask the question, how will I react if the stock falls further, right? So if you put money to work and we go down another 10%, are you going to be freaking out? Are you not going to be able to sleep at night? Because if you really can't absolve yourself of those emotions, then it might not actually be the right move. And why is that? Well, if you can't stay the course and you end up eating a loss two or three weeks later, then you're you're not benefiting from these discounted prices, you're simply losing money. Uh, and so we wanna make sure for people who realize that growth stocks are discounted, they are attractive, and it is a generational moment that you have the wherewithal both from a time horizon and an emotional time perspective to actually realize some of those gains over the long term by not letting your emotions get in the way. Lastly, how will I know if I'm wrong? Well, a few things. Are the companies executing or not executing? If they're not executing, that's the first sign that, hey, something's, something's wrong. Um, number two is the business cycle unraveling. And we don't really see that uh, at a macro level. But I think the big thing, most importantly, is the fundamental question. Are the fundamentals improving upward and to the right? And if they're not, that's when we have to make changes at the stock level. So the great growth stock reset, what are the catalysts? First, GDP is slowing. We know that as growth rates slow down, cyclical stocks start to underperform and investors turn the companies that can grow in a low growth environment. Number two, the market is now pricing in nine to 10 rate hikes. So what does that mean for us? That means that as interest rates increase, that growth rate's gonna slow down. And of course, that should start to ebb out the rate of inflation. But what we're really doing is we're buying a futures contract on what rates will do between December and June of 2023. In other words, if we see that slope starting to flatten out, that should be good for growth stocks. Number three, inflation is approaching a peak. Now, we can be wrong on this, but so far the data has suggested that. The biggest factor that has moved inflation has been goods pricing. So in other words, used cars, toys, uh, you know, uh, you can go across the board, microchips, semiconductors, computers, all these things because of the supply chain constraints led to a huge increase in pricing. We're starting to see that ebb off. Both supply chains are less stressed out because demand in the U.S. is falling. And number two, bloated inventories are leading to companies finally starting to cut prices or raise prices less fast so that they can destock some of those inventories. And then lastly, valuations have come down so dramatically over the last 12 months, while growth rates have not slowed down for many of these companies. As a result, the valuations look a lot more attractive than they did 12 months ago. And we can see here, remember, inflation is that growth stock kryptonite. What led to the big inflation surge? Well, it's this blue, these blue bars that expanded, which was those supply constrained goods. So we think of semiconductors, used cars, new cars, across the board, computers, as all those factors wear off, as people go back to work, as people spend in other areas of the economy, we're starting to see that compress. We're starting to see used car prices drop. We're starting to see those inventories be discounted. And that is good to ebb off the rate of inflation, which is good for growth stocks. So what are some of the trends that we really love right now across the portfolio? The, the five core themes we see in the portfolio Artificial intelligence. This is only adoption is only rapidly picking up. It's not declining. It's not decelerating. AMD, NVIDIA, these are two companies that provide the brains behind all of the goods that are powering artificial intelligence. We saw with Meta Platforms this week at 12 times earnings, they're growing like crazy. They're growing in that 20 to 30 percent range over a multi year time period versus Coca Cola right now, which is trading at 30 times and growing in the single digits. We prefer a company like Meta versus Coca-Cola. And then if we look at digital platforms, right? So when we look at established industries that are being disrupted by low, what we call low tangible asset in, uh, platforms, such as Uber, Airbnb, or Snap, Coinbase, Silvergate. These are platforms that millennials are using on a daily basis to live their daily life, whether that's Uber or Airbnb on vacation, Snap in terms of communication, and then of course, the alternative fin uh, digital finance 
uh, digital finance platforms such as Coinbase or Silvergate. Cloud computing, what's the big message? SilverNow or, or SilverNow, <laughs> ServiceNow, Microsoft, all these companies that are reporting are reporting accelerating earnings numbers. We saw an awful quarter from Amazon, but the one bright spot in Amazon's quarter was their cloud computing segment, which continued to grow in the 30 to 40% level. Cybersecurity, we only need to look at what's happening with the Russia and the Ukraine war and some of the knock-on effects as Russia tries to disrupt Western infrastructure. Cybersecurity is the number one spending priority of many IT infrastructure departments. That's only going to continue to grow, and the prioritization of that is only going to continue to increase. And then as my generation, the millennials, continue to grow their wealth, we want to pay attention to the millennial brands that they like. And that's companies like Lululemon or Tesla or MGM or DraftKings. These are the areas where millennials are spending their time and money. So what do we look for when we're trying to find companies that we like? A large total addressable market that can lead to a sustained period of high sales growth and market share capture. Number two, that expanding market share. We want to invest in leaders, not in trailers. Number three, a scaling business. So can a business easily scale while keeping their costs flat and fuel overall operating margin expansion? Low fixed asset cost structure. We love software companies by proxy. In other words, companies that can be respected, uh, that be located in different sectors of the economy, but have a nice software platform layer that reduces their reliance on buildings and infrastructure and people so that we can have a high overall incremental gross margin business model. Lastly, management has a strong vision and operational excellence. People are key to every company. It doesn't matter if you're a public company or private company. We see it here with our own company. We want good people to lead these companies. So what we want to do this week was do a couple case studies. We know that falling stock prices are painful. We see it leading to lower account values. But what is, but how do we look at the world? So when we see a company like ServiceNow, the stock price has been terrible. And, this, and when our clients or advisors or other investors see the, the stock price, they're like, oh my God, like this is awful. The company is doing terribly. But the reality is stock price mass in many cases, what's going on fundamentally at the company level. So yes, the stock price has fallen. Why? Rising interest rates, inflation, war, uh, the Federal Reserve, yada, yada, yada. Meanwhile, at the company level, the yellow line is revenue. And what we see here is the companies continue to make more and more money. Operating income per share, again, steady upward and to the right. They're making more money and their margins are expanding. Let's look at what ServiceNow CEO Bill McDermott had to say on the call. While there are significant challenges in the world, we all know that, uh, particularly in Eastern Europe, we have not seen a material impact on our market. To the contrary, the challenges underscore the urgency of investment in digital business. Our business is firing on all cylinders in this environment. We said in January that our fast growth would accelerate in Q1. It did. We saw the stock price reflect that the other day. Now, three months later, we expect subscription revenue growth to accelerate for the full year. It will. That's a very confident message on the call. So here's like, that is a great example of a company. The stock price has been hurt by factors that are external to the company, but the fundamentals are improving. Next case study is Tesla. Why has it been sold over the last few months? It's a growth stock, so we got to sell it. Interest rates are rising, so we're discounting future growth, so the stock price comes down. China shutdowns, inflation. More recently, the, the Twitter acquisition. So you know, uh, Elon's going to have to sell Tesla stock. All these factors that are just noise that distract us from the real picture of what's happening at Tesla, which is they're selling more and more and more and more cars. This is a fundamentally improving picture. We've gone free cash flow is growing 660% year over year, massive margin expansion. For a company to generate close to we look at the gross margins of 33% at an auto company, completely unheard of. Why? Because it's, it's a de-unionized workforce. So again, this is where we want to pay attention to the facts. Here's what Elon Musk and the CFO had to say. Last quarter, 
we demonstrate a series of new financial records, including revenue, gross margins, operating margin, and bottom line profitability. As a long-term investor, that's what I want to see. We remain confident of a 50% growth in vehicle production in 2022. And I think we have a reasonable shot of a 60% increase over last year. That is incredibly bullish. And these are the reasons at the end of the day why we're invested with Tesla. Because this is a rare long-term fundamental growth story. So what's next? As the largest stocks are finally shot, right? So when we think of at the end of the day, when we go through the market, you know, we know when we go through a market correction that it starts in one area, in this case, growth stocks, and then it kind of moved to other areas of the more cyclical space. The last fruit that were hanging on the tree were Amazon and Apple and some of these other mega cap fang names. They have finally been shot. We saw Tesla taken to the woodshed earlier this week, Amazon and Apple today, Google last week. So we're finally getting to a point where almost every stock has now felt the pain in the market. So that's when we can start to look at the stuff that was hit first, those growth stocks, and assess, hey, is growth still continuing to accelerate? And oh, by the way, the one difference is we can get them at really low prices right now. So over the next uh, month or so, what we believe is happening is the economy is slowing, inflation is beginning to ebb. Very, very key. Growth stocks have largely been de-risked at this standpoint from our perspective. So we want to focus on leading platform businesses with long growth runways. Thank you again. If you have any questions, as usual, please feel free to reach out to our office and we will be more glad to help. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.